Please stand in body or in spirit and join in our opening call to worship. God of grace and glory, who made all things. God of grace and glory, Savior of your people. God of grace and glory, ever present with us. Would you join me in affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed, which you can find at number 881 in your hymnal? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel reading is John chapter 16, beginning with the 12th verse. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I grew up in Korean Methodist churches most of my life until I myself became a, a pastor in the United Methodist Church. Most Korean churches, regardless of its denominational affiliation, whether it be in Korea or in other parts of the world, they have what's called an early morning prayer service, typically six days a week, some seven, if they're really motivated. Uh, they gather around 5 a.m. at the local churches to come uh, to worship, to have a devotion, and to prayer every morning, six days a week at 5 in the morning, which means they wake up before 5 a.m. to get there. So my father, a retired Methodist pastor now, I remember him getting up every day with my mom around 4 in the morning to get to church about quarter till 5 to lead early morning prayer services. I remember as early as a six-year-old, uh, my folks would get up and, and leave me to go to early morning prayer services. And I remember being so scared being home by myself I knew that they would return in about two hours' time. And let me just say that they're wonderful parents. For those of you who are wondering, why would they do that? <laughs> in spirit of Father's Day, it was the culture, the time, and the place. It wasn't too abnormal to leave six-year-old kids to say, take care of yourself. So every day, I remember being frightened, scared, and my parents finally decided we're going to buy him cassette tapes of Bible stories to listen to in the morning. So for those of you who may be of certain generation, uh, cassette tapes is what came before digital platform, iPods, CDs, and before that we had cassette tapes. And I knew that if I listened to two cassette tapes, both side A and B, that would be about the time when my parents would return. Morning after morning, year after year, I listened to those tapes, and even today when I read the Bible, I hear it in the voice of those tapes, the words of God, the words of Jesus the Savior. I still hear a husky callings of a Korean voice actor when I read the Bible. That's what I hear, and I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for those biblical stories that shape my faith in so many powerful ways, childish but innocent, simple yet profound uh, not always entirely theologically accurate, but a, a good beginning nevertheless. I'm grateful for those tapes. In certain ways, our passage today further illumines the nature of Trinity, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For those of you who may be wondering what this Trinity is, uh, become my Facebook friend. Look at the video of my son giving a 30-second explanation of the Holy Trinity. It's really good. And it is a testament of our children ministry, our Sunday school, and our preschool. So uh, kudos to our children ministry at our church. We see Jesus in our scripture lesson today continuing to prepare his beloved children, his disciples, for what is to come. And this is what he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. As it's been said before, it's no secret that even after three years of discipleship, even after three years of following Jesus, witnessing to Jesus' ministry and his miraculous works, so many of the disciples still have ways to go. They don't, quote, unquote, get it. There are certain things, truth that Jesus revealed that they cannot comprehend or they cannot simply bear of what is to come. Jesus on the cross 
and the call to service, to witness for all of his disciples, there's a barrier there. And John, it seems to me, is indicating that the spirituality of Christian discipleship requires ongoing understanding and interpretation. And Jesus tells his beloved disciples, I know, I know some of you are confused. I know many of you just don't get it right now, and that might get worse. I know there are certain things that's beyond your reach, but it's going to be okay because even after I'm gone, the Holy Spirit will come and declare all truth to you, you will comprehend, you will understand. The Holy Spirit will take that which is of God and declare it to you, Jesus says, to his disciples, to his beloved. As a child, I knew that my father was just the best. Happy Father's Day. Yeah. I just knew that he was the perfect dad, the most wonderful husband, and the best pastor in the world. I loved him and he loved me and that comforted me. What wonderful gift. But my childish image of my father's perfection did not last long. As I continued to grow up, I started to reflect and think about the things that have happened in my life, uh, in the life of our family that made my relationship with my father a lot more complicated. I saw my father um, as a man through the highs and lows of his life, and I saw that he was just as flawed as I was, that he was just as flawed as anybody else for that matter. I saw him as a, a father who did not always provide me with the best of example. I saw him as a husband who wasn't as perhaps present to his wife as he should have been. I saw him as a pastor who didn't always make the correct decision, that he didn't always discern correctly for the life of the church. So as a 37-year-old now, compared to my six-year-old self, my relationship with my father is so much more nuanced. It's far more rich than it's ever been before, but my love of my father is grounded in reality and tested through time. I can tell you, friends, in all honesty, that I love my dad and trust my father now more than I ever did as a child. But it took some growing pain. It took some turns. Howard Hanshi, an Episcopal priest, writes this about our faith journey and our relationship to our God and our need to read, study, and meditate on the holy text. This is what he writes. I found that many adults drop out of church because their knowledge of God doesn't keep pace with the reality of their adult lives. I'm going to repeat that sentence. Many adults drop out of church because their knowledge of God doesn't keep pace with the reality of their adult lives. Part of the work of Christian maturation is setting ourselves to the task of broadening our childhood and adolescent understanding of God. In and of themselves, there is nothing wrong with our early ideas, but adulthood demands a far richer belief in God than our early years provide. I can attest to that. That's been true of my life. Walter Brueggemann, a Christian theologian, further suggests that we as human beings find ourselves in one of three phases in life, whether it be in life in the secular world and especially in our journey as spiritual beings. The first place, the first stage of our spiritual journey is a place of orientation. And just like it sounds, it's when we are firmly oriented, when everything makes sense about our life, about the world, and about our God. That's not a bad place to be when we feel like we're standing on solid grounds. But eventually, sooner or later, all of us will get to a different stage in our spiritual walk, a place of disorientation, where what we used to hold true no longer holds water, whether it be of our lives, our relationship to the world, and our relationship to our God. When I used to believe as a child, if I do A and B, God will surely respond by doing C and D. That type of theology, as true as it can be and may be at times, is not always true. And I find myself, we find ourselves wondering what is true about our faith? What is true about our God? What can I depend on in this world? And this place of disorientation can be daunting and challenging. But eventually, if we should stay patient, if we should cling on to the grace of God, if we should rely on one another, 
the place, the stage of disorientation leads us to a place of new orientation where our faith, our belief, our relationship with God is richer. It becomes stronger. Though our faith may be nuanced, it's stronger than ever before. And this three stages starts over again and again and again. It's called growth, that we go from orientation to disorientation to a new place, new orientation, that we grow in our faith, we grow in our lives, we grow in relationship to one another. Paul speaks to this as well, our need to continuously grow and mature in our faith, in our discipleship, in our reading and understanding of God from the familiar passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is what Paul writes, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. So like I said, some of us, some of you here may be in a place of orientation. Good for you where everything makes sense in your life, that's a good place to be. I celebrate that with you. And if you should be in that place, all the more reason for you to reach out to those in a place of disorientation, that you be service to them, that you witness to them, that those who are disoriented will find a hospitable place with you and in you. And if you're like me, I constantly find my life my relationship to my world and to my God in a place of disorientation. If this is you, it can be so strange, unfamiliar, lonely, and even scary. I invite you to hang on. I invite you to hang on. As Jesus says to his disciples, your life's going to get a little complicated. Your Christian discipleship will turn upside down, inside out. Hang on. In due time, even when I'm gone, the Holy Spirit will come and declare all truth to you. Take all that which belongs to God and give it to you. It will be okay. Things will make sense sooner or later. Keep on going. Stay with me. And friends, it's been my experience and experience that I've seen in other people that when we are in our place of disorientation, it is only through the, the grace and mercy and the loving ways of God that will lead us toward the new orientation. But that's not just the only way. I often find that God uses the hands and feet of brothers and sisters in Christ to take us from where we are to where God wants us to be. That is to say that when we go from the place of disorientation to new orientation, it'll be one another that will lead us there, that will take us there. A place where we are in deeper relationship with our God, where we grow in our depth of gratitude, that we become more thankful for having gone through this journey. We do that together. And without said, I pray that we will always grow in our thanksgiving of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And not only that, that we will always continuously grow in thanksgiving of one another of the people that is in this space, of the very brothers and sisters that we get to journey together. What a privilege it is that when I am down, you will lift me up. And when you are low, I will seek you out, that we do this journey together. John imagines a Christian community that is not only just locked into the past, but understands what that Jesus, when he means that Holy Spirit will come to you, that Part of our job as Christian community is to engage in ongoing interpretation and new understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. And that transformation, that journey can seem scary and daunting at times, but it's gonna be okay. Because if Jesus is correct, then I believe that he is. The Holy Spirit will declare the things that are to come. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will guide you in all the truth. So friends, let us remain faithful always. Let us remain faithful together. That is the only way we can remain faithful. And trust that even in our times of uncertainty, that God has not abandoned us, that the Holy Spirit will declare all of God's truth to us and lead us and guide us to a place where God desires Marsh Park United Methodist Church to be. Thanks be to God. Amen.